welcome to our Bible Ponder for this week. We're going to be looking at the first half of chapter 19 because it's quite a big chapter and there's quite a lot in it. The second half of the chapter that we'll look at next week um, also it contains the um, triumphal entry into Jerusalem and Jesus going into the temple courts and overturning tables and things like that. So we'll give that its own week to kind of dive into that a bit more. But this week we'll look at the two stories at the front half of chapter 19. Um, the first being that of Zacchaeus, that, that very well-worn tale of um, the wee man was he. And then we'll talk about the parable of um, what Luke has as the ten minas, or um, your Bible might call it the ten pounds, um, which is a similar tale to, to Matthew's parable of the talents. And we'll talk about the similarities and the differences of both of those. So first off, the, the story of Zacchaeus is a, a good old story that we um, have all the time. We even have it in the kids' Bible that we use in Ellen. And so it's one of the stories that gets read to the children and that the children look at um, consistently year after year because it's an important story to us. Not only is it memorable, you have the details of Zacchaeus being named him being very short, which given um, the culture of the time and, and kind of the, the stature of people means he was probably shorter than five feet tall. You have the details of the sycamore tree, all, all sorts of things that stick in our mind, plus the repentance and, and Jesus um, welcoming him and inviting himself over and all of that. Um, so there's a lot of details that make it memorable. It's short, it's punchy. Um, and it's about repentance and about forgiveness and all of these sorts of things that are really important to us and foundational to our faith. So because it's a story we know quite well, there's a few things I'll point out just sort of historically. Um, the first being that it was pretty unheard of, even for someone who was well known and had a high stature, to invite themselves over to someone else's house to eat. Um, I was always told as a kid not to invite myself over to anyone's house. Um, this was a, a big tenet of the ancient world as well. You do not invite yourself over. So for Jesus to do that is pretty um, presumptuous, but shows um, kind of his gravitas. Um, for him to name Zacchaeus without having ever met him, Zacchaeus is up in the tree and Jesus calls him by name, um, was something that was thought only prophets could do to, to look at someone and be able to know their name. Again, we've talked a bit about the historical context for tax collectors, how much they were hated, they were seen as traitors, and as, you know, again, Luke's narrative even calls him a sinner. You wouldn't eat with them, then you wouldn't associate with them. So for Jesus to do that um, is, is pretty out of the ordinary. This is a, a very classic eating and punchy tale that gets really into that um, welcome and conflict idea that Jesus welcomes Zacchaeus even actively. It's not even that um, Zacchaeus asks for forgiveness, though he says he's going to repay what he's done, but Jesus offers it to him and says, salvation has come to this house. Um, but you also have the grumblers who are, again, mad that Jesus is welcoming Zacchaeus. Um, there's also the idea, and this is um, something that isn't um, wholly proven, but there's an interesting idea in, in um, amongst people who study um, the Bible historically about names in the Bible. Um, Luke is someone who's a very careful historian in many ways. He's not just um, writing a tale. He's also... Um, careful about what he includes, but not just, just for Luke, but there's a lot of thought about um, who gets named in the New Testament and who doesn't get named. There's plenty of stories of people who are healed, who go unnamed. Sometimes they just have a title like a centurion or a synagogue leader. Sometimes they actually get named. Um, so one of the thoughts about people who get named specifically is that they might get named, not just because, oh, the writer knew their name. So Luke, hearing the story, hears some Zacchaeus and other stories, he doesn't know their name. But the people who are named are often named specifically because they might have still been known to people when they were writing it, or might have been, even if they weren't still alive, they might have been well known enough as early Christians or leaders in the church that they would have been known. So Luke might have been writing the story. And he names Zacchaeus because maybe Zacchaeus became a follower of Jesus and ends up as a prominent early Christian. And again, whether Zacchaeus is still alive or not at the time that Luke writes this, um, 
it could be that he is someone who would be known to the community that Luke is writing to. Now, that's just, it's a theory that, that can't be proved either way, but there's certainly some interesting things about names and interesting work that goes into some of that. But again, the, the biggest takeaway from this is, is that this is a really good encapsulation of that welcome and conflict motif throughout all of Luke. Now we get the parable of the 10 minas, or again, the 10 pounds that might be in your Bible. Um, this is very similar to Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30, which is the parable of the talents. So there are some uh, pretty big similarities, the similarities being a rich man, a ruler, a whoever, um, who is going away, who entrusts three servants with three amounts of money. Um, the first being 10, five, and then one. And then when they come back, 10, the, those slave of 10 has multiplied it, the slave of five has multiplied it, the slave of one has hidden it away. And um, in each of the narratives, the slave of one is um, uh, is in trouble. So the differences are, um, first off, uh, pretty obviously the amounts of money. A mina is about uh, 100 days wages. And so to have 10 minas is, you know, a thousand days wages or, or you know, do, do your maths all the way down. Uh, a talent <clears throat> was <clears throat> a lot of money. A talent was something like um, <clears throat> 600 days wage or a denarius was 600 days wages and a talent is a huge amount of denarii. So um, there's a pretty big difference in the amounts of money that are given. The other differences are slightly different setting for the tale. So um, it could be that these are not um, <clears throat> the same story, that, that um, sometimes there's parallel versions in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they're probably from the same source or the same story, just e each author has kind of put a little bit of a spin on it. Um, this one might actually be two different stories that Jesus told because there's enough differences and enough of a different setting that it could very well be two different things. Um, the setting is different in, in Matthew. It's in the discourse when he's on the Mount of Olives, and it's in the midst of a lot about um, getting ready for Jesus to come back it's near the parable of the ten virgins. And it's, you know, he's in Jerusalem. He's getting ready to, to die, all of that. Here, he's still in Jericho. He's still a little bit away from Jerusalem. It's about 17 miles from Jerusalem. And the context that Luke gives us is while they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. So in Matthew's gospel, the, that parable uh, combined again with the context of the parable of the ten virgins is that you don't know when Jesus is going to come back. So you have to be ready. And so for the, the slaves with the talents, they need to be ready because they don't know when the master is going to come back. And so they need to put their talents to work um, so that they're ready when the master comes back. Whereas here, Jesus is almost telling this parable as a way to kind of say, hey, hold on to your expectations. You're expecting me to go to Jerusalem and <clears throat> start a war, enact the kingdom, do any of that sort of thing. And it's not going to happen hang fire a little bit. Um, and so that's a, a slightly different context. The other thing is Luke in this story has a, a pretty interesting historical parallel, which I don't quite know what to do with in terms of how we interpret the story, but we'll talk about that. Um, in Matthew's parable, we're fairly scant on the details. It's um, it, He is a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. It's pretty scant on details. Whereas this one says, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then return. This is something that did happen. And specifically, it happened with Herod the Great and Herod Archelaus, who was a descendant of Herod the Great and king of the Jews. And Herod the Great and Herod Archelaus had to go to Rome to have their rule over um, the land um, granted. So they, they were ruling, but it had to go be sort of you know, made official. And with Herod Archelaus specifically, when he went, the people hated him and sent a delegation ahead of him to Rome to protest his being appointed. And then when he returns to Jerusalem, he rounds up all of the people who um, kind of organized that and has them slaughtered. 
So again, Matthew scant on the details. Luke has a man of noble birth who went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then return. And his subjects, this is verse 14, but his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. And then at the end, the man of noble birth says, but those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. So you have pretty strong parallels there to Herod Archelaus, but I'm not sure what that adds to the interpretation necessarily, other than it might just twig for Jesus's hearers that, oh, this sounds familiar. Um, we are kind of predisposed, I think, to presume that the man of noble birth or the, the wealthy man is God in this story, and that God is then giving us, as his servants, 10 minas or 5 minas or 1 mina, and then it's up to us to do with it what we should and that's probably the, the easiest on, on the surface interpretation. And it works for this as well. And for Luke's context, if he's saying, hold on, hold your expectations, what he might be saying is, I'm going away for a bit. And so while I'm gone, you have 10 talents, 5 talents, or 10 minus, 5 minus, 1 minus. Put it to work because you've got some time to wait. I'm not coming back right away. So, um, you know, the kingdom is not coming right away. So invest this, get it to work, make money out of this. Don't just hide it away because I'm not coming back right away. In Matthew's version, of course, it's more put it to work because you don't know when he's coming back. He could be coming back any second. Um, and so that works on its surface. There's another way of interpreting, interpreting this parable that I think, and, and also the parable of the talents, that I think is really interesting and maybe more interesting with the Herod Archelaus par parallel for Luke. And it's an interpretation that comes out of liberation theology, which is um, a way of reading the Bible and reading theology that specifically thinks about how people who are marginalized and who are oppressed, um, how God is on their side and how um, the idea of liberation is at the core of how we read these texts. And, and that's more um, central to the way of reading the text than a sort of triumphal we're in charge Christendom sort of way. And the liberation theology way of reading both of these parallels is that the last servant is actually um, the good guy, not the bad guy. The normal way of reading this is that the last servant who hides the money away in the parable of the talents, they bury it in this parable in Luke, they cover it with a cloth and hide it away, which is probably the dumbest thing you can do. They don't even lock it in a strong box or you know put it in a kind of safe or they don't put it in the bank. And so they're not only not putting it to work, they're kind of careless with it in Luke's parallel, parable. Um, but the servant in both of them points out something when the rich person returns. The, the servant says, um, I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you do not put in and you reap what you do not sow, which is similar to Matthew's um, he said, uh, I know that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went and hid your gold in the ground. Here is what belongs to you. Um, and so what a liberation theology interpretation of this is that the um, slave with the one mina or one talent is more of like a whistleblower on a corrupt ruler. And so the corrupt ruler is not God, but the... Um, one with the one talent is actually a, a, a the good guy, the whistleblower, saying you are actually a, a ruthless, wealthy ruler who is unscrupulous, in fact, maybe even corrupt. And I was afraid. And so I just hid this away because I didn't know what else to do. And I didn't want to make you even more money. I didn't want to participate in your economy and make you even wealthier. Um, and that's a really interesting way to look at it. I think I would need some more time to sit and think about it to tell you what I thought either way. I think they could probably both be true. I think Matthew's context makes me lean more towards the idea of the return of, of the wealthy person. But Luke's context, I could see that really working because the um, wealth, the man of noble birth who has these servants is um, not a nice character. And so I, I would have trouble kind of associating this character with God or, or Jesus, um, especially when they come back and they just round up the people who didn't want them to be king and have them killed. It's not the kind of um, judgment 
kind of language of, of often Jesus's parallels where the God character is angry at the rejection. Um, these people seem to have a, I don't know, they, they, it's not like they're rejecting the king because the king is good. They, they might have just cause. And the parallels with Herod Archelaus then makes me wonder if, if this is a parallel more um, flipped than the parable of the talents. I don't know. Something to, to really think about. I'll, uh, I'll, in my back of my head, spend more time kind of chewing on that. But I think it's a really interesting way to, to think about the, the slave of the one mina maybe being a whistleblower more than the bad guy. Interesting way to, to look at this. Thanks for sticking with us. As I said, and this chapter has quite a lot as we're at 16 minutes. So um, we'll carry on with the, the rest of the chapter next week. Um, thanks for joining with us, and um, I hope that you have a good evening. Bye-bye.